The best of everything. Nobody expected Grace to do any work the Friday before her wedding. In fact, nobody would let her, whether she wanted to or not. The gardenia corsage lay in a cellophane box beside her typewriter, from Mr. Atwood, her boss, and tucked inside the envelope that came with it was a $10 gift certificate from Bloomingdale's. Mr. Atwood had treated her with a special court ever since the time she necked with him at the office Christmas party, and now when she went in to thank him, he was all hunched over, rattling desk drawers, blushing and barely meeting her eyes. Aw, oh, now, don't mention it, Grace, he said. Pleasure's all mine. Here, you need a pin to put that gadget on with? There's a pin that came with it, she said, holding up the corsage. See, a nice white one. Beaming, he watched her pin the flowers high on the lapel of her suit. Then he cleared his throat importantly and pulled out the writing panel of his desk, ready to give the morning's dictation. But it turned out there were only two short letters, and it wasn't until an hour later when she caught him handle, handing over a pile of dictaphone cylinders to central typing that she realized he had done her a favor. That's very sweet of you, Mr. Atwood, she said, but I do think you ought to give me all your work today, just like any other- Aw, oh, now, Grace, he said. You only get married once. The girls all made a fuss over her, too, crowding around her desk and giggling, asking again and again to see Ralph's photograph. Oh, he's cute! While the office manager looked on, nervously reluctant to be a spoil sport, but anxious to point out that it was, after all, a working day. Then at lunch, there was the traditional little party at Schraff's. Nine women and girls, giddy on their unfamiliar cocktails, letting their chicken a la king grow cold while they pummeled with her, pummeled her with old times and good wishes. There were more flowers and another gift, a silver candy dish for which all the girls had whisperingly chipped in. Grace said, thank you, and I certainly do appreciate it. And I don't know what to say, until her head rang with the words and the corners of her mouth ached from smiling, and she thought the afternoon would never end. Ralph called up about four o'clock, exuberant. How you doing, honey? He asked, and before she could answer, he said, listen, guess what I got? I don't know, a present or something? What? She tried to sound excited, but it wasn't easy. A bonus, fifty dollars. She could almost see the flattening of his lips as he said fifty dollars, with a particular earnestness he reserved for pronouncing sums of money. Why, that's lovely, Ralph, she said, and if there was any tiredness in her voice, he didn't notice it. Lovely, huh? he said with a laugh, mocking the girlishness of the word. You like that, huh, Gracie? No, but I mean, I was really surprised, you know it. The boss says, here, Ralph, and he hands me this envelope. He don't even crack a smile or nothing, and I'm wondering, what's the deal here? I'm getting fired here, or what? He says, go ahead, Ralph, open it. So I open it, and then I look at the boss, and he's grinning a mile wide. He chuckled and sighed. Well, so listen, honey, what time you want me to come over tonight? Oh, I don't know. As soon as you can, I guess. Well, listen, I gotta go over to Eddie's house and pick up that bag he's gonna loan me, so I might as well do that, go on home and eat, and then come over to your place around... 8.30, 9 o'clock, okay? All right, she said. I'll see you then, darling. She had been calling him darling for only a short time since it had become irrevocably clear that she was, after all, going to marry him. And the words still had an alien sound. As she straightened the stacks of stationery in her desk, because there was nothing else to do, a familiar little panic gripped her. She couldn't marry him. She hardly even knew him. Sometimes it occurred to her differently that she couldn't marry him because she knew him too well, and either way it left her badly shaken, vulnerable to all things that Martha, her roommate, had said from the very beginning. Isn't he funny? Martha had said after their first date. He says, turlet. I didn't know people really said turlet, and Grace had giggled, ready enough to agree that it was funny. That was a time when she had been ready to agree with Martha on practically anything. When it often seemed, in fact, that finding a girl like Martha from an ad in the Times was just about the luckiest thing that had ever happened to her. But Ralph had persisted all through the summer, and by fall she had begun standing up for him. What don't you like about him, Martha? He's perfectly nice. 
Oh, everybody's perfectly nice, Grace, Martha would say in her college voice, making perfectly nice a faintly absurd thing to be. And then she'd look up crossly from the careful painting of her fingernails. It's just that he's such a little, a little white worm. Can't you see that? Well, I certainly don't see what his complexion has to do with... Oh, God. You know what I mean. Can't you see what I mean? Oh, and all those friends of his, his Eddie and his Marty and his George with their mean, ratty little clerks' his lives and their mean, ratty little... And it's just that they're all alike, those people. All they ever say is, hey, what happened to your Giants? And hey, what happened to your Yankees? And they all live way out in Sunnyside or Woodhaven or some awful place. And their mothers have those damn little china elephants on the mantelpiece. And Martha would frown over her nail polish again, making it clear that the, that the subject was closed. All that fall and winter, she was confused. For a while, she tried going out only with Martha's kind of men, the kind that used words like amusing all the time and wore small-shouldered flannel suits like a uniform. And for a while, she tried going out with no men at all. She even tried that crazy business with Mr. Atwood at the office Christmas party. And all the time, Ralph kept calling up, hanging around, waiting for her to make up her mind. Once she took him home to meet her parents in Pennsylvania, where she never would have dreamed of taking Martha, but it wasn't until Easter time that she finally gave in. They had gone to a dance somewhere in Queens, one of the big American Legion dances that Ralph's crowd was always going to, and when the band played Easter Parade, he held her very close, hardly moving, and sang to her in a faint, whispering tenor. It was the kind of thing she'd never have expected Ralph to do, a sweet, gentle thing. And it probably wasn't just then that she decided to marry him, but it always seemed so afterwards. It always seemed she had decided that minute, swaying to the music with his husky voice in her hair. I'll be all in clover, and when they look you over, I'll be the proudest fella in the Easter parade. That night, she had told Martha, and she could still see the look on Martha's face. Oh, Grace, you're not... Surely you're not serious. I mean, I thought he was more or less of a joke. You can't really mean you want to... Shut up. You just shut up, Martha. And she'd cried all night. Even now, she hated Martha for it. Even as she stared blindly at a row of filing cabinets along the office wall, half sick with fear that Martha was right. The noise of giggles swept over her, and she saw with a start that two of the girls... Irene and Rose were grinning over their typewriters and pointing at her. We saw ya, Irene sang. We saw ya, mooning again, huh, Grace? Then Rose did a burlesque of mooning, heaving her meager breasts and batting her eyes, and they both collapsed in laughter. With an effort of will, Grace resumed the guileless open smile of a bride. The thing to do was concentrate on plans. Tomorrow morning, bright and early, as her mother would say, she would meet Ralph at Penn Station for the trip home. They'd arrive about one, and her parents would meet the train. Good to see you, Ralph, her father would say, and her mother would probably kiss him. A warm, homely love filled her. They wouldn't call him a white worm. They didn't have any ideas about Princeton men and interesting men and all the other kinds of men Martha was so stuck up about. Then her father would probably take Ralph out for a beer and show him the paper mill where he worked. And at least Ralph wouldn't be snobby about a person working at, in a paper mill either. And then Ralph's family and friends would come down from New York in the evening. She'd have time for a long talk with her mother that night, and the next morning, bright and early, her eyes stung at the thought of her mother's plain, happy face, they would start getting dressed for the wedding. Then the church and the ceremony, and then the reception... Would her father get drunk? Would, Mur would Mur Muriel Ketchell sulk about not being a bridesmaid? And finally, the train to Atlantic City in the hotel. But from the hotel on, she couldn't plan anymore. A door would lock behind her, and there would be a wild, fantastic silence. And nobody in all the world but Ralph to lead the way. Well, Grace, Mr. Atwood was saying, I want to wish you every happiness. He was standing at her desk with his hat and coat on, and all around here were the chattering and scraping back of chairs that meant it was five o'clock. Thank you, Mr. Atwood. She got to her feet, suddenly surrounded by all the girls in a bedlam of farewell. All the luck in the world, Grace. Drop us a card, huh, Grace, from Atlantic City? 
So long, Grace. Good night, Grace, and listen, the best of everything. Finally, she was free of the mall, out of the elevator, out of the building, hurrying through the crowds to the subway. When she got home, Martha was standing in the door of the kitchenette, looking very svelte in a crisp new dress. Oh, no. Oh, hi, Grace. I bet they ate you alive today, didn't they? Oh, no, Grace said. Everybody was real nice. She sat down, exhausted, and dropped the flowers in the wrapped candy dish on the table. Then she noticed that the whole apartment was swept and dusted, and the dinner was cooking in the kitchenette. Gee, everything looks wonderful, she said. What'd you do all this for? Oh, well, I got home early anyway, Martha said. Then she smiled, and it was one of the few times Grace had ever seen her look shy. I just thought it might be nice to have the place looking decent for a change when Ralph comes over. Well, Grace said, it certainly was nice of you. The way Martha looked now was even more surprising. She looked awkward. She was turning a greasy spatula in her fingers, holding it delicately away from her dress and examining it, as if she had something difficult to say. Look, Grace, she began, you do understand why I can't come to the wedding, don't you? Oh, sure, Grace said, although, in fact, she didn't exactly. It was something about having to go up to Harvard to see her brother before he went into the army, but it, it had sounded like a lie from the beginning. It's just that I hate you to think I... Well, anyway, I'm glad if you do understand. And the other thing I wanted to say is more important. What? Well, just that I'm sorry for all the awful things I used to say about Ralph. I never had a right to talk to you that way. He's a very sweet boy, and I... Well, I'm sorry. That's all. It wasn't easy for Grace to hide a rush of gratitude and relief when she said, well, Why, that's all right, Martha. I, The chops are on fire. Martha bolted for the kitchenette. It's all right, she called back. They're edible. And when she came out to serve dinner, all her old composure was restored. I'll have to eat and run, she said as they sat down. My train leaves in 40 minutes. I thought it was tomorrow you were going. Well, it was, actually, Martha said, but I decided to go tonight. Because, you see, Grace, another thing, if you can stand one more apology, another thing I'm sorry for is that I've hardly ever given you and Ralph a chance to be alone here. So tonight I'm going to clear out. She hesitated. It'll be a sort of wedding gift for me, okay? And then she smiled, not shyly this time, but in a way that was more in character. The eyes subtly averted after a flicker of special meaning. It was a smile that Grace... Through stages of suspicion, bewilderment, awe, and practice imitation, had long ago come to associate with the word sophisticated. Well, that's very sweet of you, Grace said, but she didn't really get the point just then. It wasn't until long after the meal was over and the dishes washed until Martha had left for, for her train in a whirl of cosmetics and luggage and quick goodbyes that she began, she began to understand. She took a deep, voluptuous bath and spent a long time drying herself, posing in the mirror filled with a strange, slow excitement. In her bedroom, from the rust rustling tissues of an expensive white box, she drew the prizes of her trousseau, a sheer nightgown of white nylon and a matching negligee, put them on, and went to the mirror again. She had never worn anything like this before, or felt like this, and the thought of letting Ralph see her like this sent her into the kitchenette for a glass of the special dry sherry Martha kept for cocktail parties. Then she turned out all the lights but one, and carrying her glass went to the sofa and arranged herself there to wait for him. After a while, she got up and brought the sherry bottle over to the coffee table where she set it on a tray with another glass. When Ralph left the office, he felt vaguely let down. Somehow he'd expected more of the Friday before his wedding. More of the Friday before his wedding. The bonus check had been all right, though secretly he'd been counting on twice that amount, and the boys had bought him a drink at lunch and kicked around in the appropriate way. Ah, uh, don't feel too bad, Ralph. Worse things could happen. But still, there ought to have been a real party. Not just the boys in the office, but Eddie and all his friends. Instead, there would only be meeting there would only be meeting Eddie at the White Rose like every other night of the year and riding home to borrow Eddie's suitcase and to eat, and then having to ride all the way back to Manhattan just to see Gracie for an hour or two. Eddie wasn't in the bar when he arrived, which sharpened the edge of his loneliness. 
Morosely, he drank a beer, waiting. Eddie was his best friend, and an ideal best man because he'd been in, in on the courtship of Gracie from the start. It was in this very bar, in fact, that Ralph had told him about their first date last summer. Oh, Eddie, what a pair of knockers. And Eddie he had grinned, yeah, so what's the roommate like? Uh, you don't want to be, you don't want the roommate, Eddie. The roommate's a dog. A snob, too, I think. No, but this other one, this little racy boy, I mean, she is stacked. Half the fun of every date, even more than half, had been telling Eddie about it afterwards, exaggerating a little here and there, and asking Eddie's advice on tactics. But after today, like so many other pleasures, it would all be left behind. Gracie had promised him at least one night off a week to spend with the boys after they were married, but even so, it would never be the same. Girls never understood a thing like friendship. There was a ball game on the bar's television screen, and he watched it idly, his throat swelling in a sentimental pain of loss. Nearly all his life had been devoted to the friendship of boys and men, to trying to be a good guy, and now the best of it was over. Finally, Eddie's stiff finger jabbed the seat of his pants in greeting. What do you say, sport? Ralph narrowed his eyes to indolent contempt and slowly turned around. What happened to you, wise guy? Get lost? What are you, in a hurry or something? Eddie barely moved his lips when he spoke. Can't wait two minutes? He slouched on a stool and slid a quarter at the bartender. Draw one there, Jack. They drank in silence for a while, staring at the television. Got a little bonus today, Ralph said. Fifty dollars. Yeah, Eddie said. Good. A batter struck out. The inning was over and the commercial came on. So, Eddie said, rocking the beer around in his glass, still gonna get married? Why not, Ralph said with a shrug. Listen, finish that, will ya? I wanna get a move on. Wait a while, wait a while, what's your hurry? Come on, will ya? Ralph stepped impatiently away from the bar. I wanna go pick up your bag. Ah, bag schmag. Ralph moved up close again and glowered at him. Look, wise guy, nobody's gonna make you loan me the goddamn bag, you know? I don't wanna break your heart or nothing. All right, all right, all right. You'll get your bag. Don't worry so much. He finished the beer and wiped his mouth. Let's go. Having to borrow a bag for his wedding trip was a sore point with Ralph. He'd much rather have bought one of his own. There was a fine one displayed in the window of a luggage shop that they passed every night on their way to the subway. A big, tawny gladstone with a zippered compartment on the side. At thirty nine ninety five, and Ralph had had his eye on it ever since Easter time. I think I'll buy that, he told Eddie in the same offhand way that a day or so before he had announced his engagement. Think I'll marry the girl. Eddie's response to both remarks had been the same. What are you, crazy? Both times Ralph had said, why not? And in defense of the bag, he added, gonna get married, I'll need something like that. From then on, it was as if the bag, almost as much as Gracie herself, had become a symbol of the new and richer life he sought. But after the ring and the new clothes and all the other expenses, he'd found at least that he couldn't afford it. He had settled for the loan of Eddie's, which was similar but cheaper and worn, and without the zippered compartment. Now as they passed the luggage shop, he stopped, caught in the grip of a reckless idea. Hey, wait a while, Eddie. Know what I think I'll do with the fifty with that fifty dollar bonus? I think I'll buy, buy that bag right now. He felt breathless. What are you crazy? Forty bucks for a bag you'll use maybe one time a year? You crazy, Ralph? Come on. Uh, I don't know. You think so? Listen, you better keep your money, boy. You're gonna need it. Ah, uh, yeah. Ralph said at last. I guess you're right. And he fell in step with Eddie again, heading for the subway. This was the way things usually turned out in his life. He could never own a bag like that until he made a better salary, and he accepted it, just as he'd accepted without question after the first thin sigh the knowledge that he'd never possess his bride until after the wedding. The subway swallowed them, rattled and banged them along in a, in a rocking, mindless trance for half an hour, and disgorged them at last into the cool early evening of Queens. Removing their coats and loosening their ties, they let the breeze dry their sweated shirts as they walked. So what's the deal? Eddie asked. What time are we supposed to show up in this Pennsylvania burg tomorrow? Ah, uh, suit yourself, Ralph said. Any time in the evening is okay. So what do we do then? 
what the hell can you do in a hillbilly town like that anyway? I don't know, Ralph said defensively. Sit around and talk, I guess? Drink beer with Gracie's old man or something? I don't know. Jesus, Eddie said. Some weekend. Big, big deal. Ralph stopped on the sidewalk, suddenly enraged, his damp coat wadded in his fist. Look, you bastard. Nobody's gonna make you come, you know? You or Marty or George or any of the rest of them. Get that straight? You're not doing me no favors, understand? What's the matter? Eddie inquired. What's the matter? Can't you take a joke? Joke? Ralph said. You're full of jokes. And plodding sullenly in Eddie's wake, he felt close to tears. They turned off into the block where they both lived, a double row of neat, identical houses bordering the street where they'd fought and loafed and played stickball all their lives. Eddie pushed open the front door of his, of his house and ushered Ralph into the vestibule, with its homely smell of cauliflower and overshoes. Go on in, he said, jerking a thumb at the closed living room door, and he hung back to let Ralph go first. Ralph opened the door and took three steps inside before it hit him like a sock on the jaw. The room, dead silent, was packed deep with grinning red-faced men. Marty, George, the boys from the block, the boys from the office, everybody. All his friends, all on their feet and poised motionless in a solid mess. Skinny McGuire was crouched at the upright piano, his spread fingers high over the keys, and when he struck the first rollicking chords, they all roared into song, beating time with their fists, their enormous grins distorting the words, For he's a jolly good fella, for he's a jolly good fella, for he's a jolly good fella, that nobody can deny. Weakly, Ralph retreated a step on the carpet and stood there, wide-eyed, swallowing, holding his coat. That nobody can deny, they sang, that nobody can deny. And as they swung into the second chorus, Eddie's father appeared through the dining room curtains, bald and beaming in full song, with a great glass pitcher of beer in either hand. At last, Skinny hammered out the final line, That nobody can deny. And they all surged forward, cheering, grabbing Ralph's hand, pounding his arms and his back while he stood trembling, his own voice lost under the noise. Gee, fellas, thanks. I don't know what to... Thanks, fellas. Then the crowd cleaved in half, and Eddie made his way slowly down the middle. His eyes gleamed in a smile of love and and from his bashful hand hung the suitcase. Not his own, but a new one. The big, tawny Gladstone with the zippered compartment on the side. Speech! They were yelling, speech! Speech! But Ralph couldn't speak and couldn't smile. He could hardly even see. At ten o'clock, Grace began walking around the apartment and biting her lip. What if he wasn't coming? But of course he was coming. She sat down again and carefully smoothed the billows of nylon around her thighs, forcing herself to be calm. The whole thing would be ruined if she was nervous. The noise of the doorbell was like an electric shock. She was halfway to the door before she stopped, breathing hard, and composed herself again. Then she pressed the buzzer and opened the door crack to watch for him on the stairs. When she saw he was carrying a suitcase and saw the pale seriousness of his face as he mounted the stairs, she thought at first that he knew. He had come prepared to lock the door and take her in his arms. Hello, darling, she said softly and opened the door wider. Hi, baby. He brushed past her and walked inside. Guess I'm late, huh? You in bed? No. She closed the door and leaned against it with both hands holding the doorknob at the small of her back, the way heroines close doors in the movies. I was just waiting for you. He wasn't looking at her. He went to the sofa and sat down, holding the suitcase on his lap and running his fingers over its surface. Gracie, he said, barely above a whisper, look at this. She looked at it and then into his tragic eyes. Remember, he said, I told you about the bag, that bag that I wanted to buy, $40? He stopped and looked around. Hey, where's Martha? She in bed. She's gone, darling, Grace said, moving slowly toward the sofa. She's gone for the whole weekend. She sat down beside him, leaned close, and gave him Martha's special smile. Oh, yeah? He said. Well, anyway, listen. I said I was going to borrow Eddie's bag instead, remember? Yes. Well, so tonight at the White Rose, I says, come on, Eddie, let's go home and pick up your bag. He says, ah, bag schmag, I says, what's the matter? But he don't say nothing, see? So we go home to his place, and the living room's door's shut, see? Living room door's shut, see? 
She squirmed closer and put her head on his chest. Automatically, he raised an arm and dropped it around her shoulder, still talking. He says, go ahead, Ralph. Open the door. I says, what's the deal? He says, never mind. Ralph, open the door. So he opened the door and, oh, Jesus. His fingers gripped her shoulder with such an intensity that she looked up at him in alarm. They were, they was all there, Gracie, he said. All the fellas. Playing the pianist, singing, cheering. His voice wavered and his eyes fluttered shut, their lashes wet. A big surprise party, he said, trying to smile. For me, can you beat that, Gracie? And then, and then Eddie comes out and Eddie comes out and hands me this. The very same bag I've been looking at all this time. He bought it with his own money and he didn't say nothing just to give me a surprise. Here, Ralph, he says, just to let you know you're the greatest guy in the world. His fingers tightened again, trembling. I cried, Gracie, he whispered. I couldn't help it. I don't think the fellas saw it or anything, but I was crying. He turned his face away and worked his lip lips in a tremendous effort to hold back the tears. Would you like a drink, darling? She asked tenderly. No, nah, that's all right, Gracie. I'm all right. Gently, he set the suitcase on the carpet. Only give me a cigarette, huh? She got one from the coffee table, put it in his lips and lit it. Let me get you a drink, she said. He frowned through the smoke. What do you got, that cherry wine? No, nah, I don't like that stuff. Anyway, I'm full of beer. He leaned back and closed his eyes. And then Eddie's mother feeds us this terrific meal, he went on, and his voice was almost normal now. We had steaks. We had french fried potatoes. His head rolled on the sofa back with each item on the menu. Lettuce and tomato salad, pickles, bread, butter, everything. The works. Well, she said, wasn't that nice? And afterwards, we had ice cream and coffee, he said, and all the beer we could drink. I mean, it was a real spread. Grace ran her hands over her lap, partly to smooth the nylon and partly to dry the moisture on her palms. Well, that certainly was nice of them, she said. They sat there silent for what seemed a long time. I can only stay a minute, Gracie, Ralph said at last. I promised him I'd be back. Her heart thumped under her nylons. Ralph, do you, do you like this? What, honey? My negligee. You weren't supposed to see it until after the wedding, but I thought I'd... Nice, he said, feeling the flimsy material between thumb and index finger like a merchant. Very nice. What'd you pay for this, honey? Oh, I don't know, but do you like it? He kissed her and began, at last, to stroke her with his hands. Nice, he kept saying. Nice. Hey, I like this. His hand hesitated at the low neckline, slipped inside and held her breast. I do love you, Ralph, she whispered. You know that, don't you? His fingers pinched her nipple once, and she did quickly... And she and slid quickly out again. The policy of restraint, the habit of months, was too strong to break. Sure, he said. And I love you, baby. Now you be a good girl and get your beauty sleep, and I'll see you in the morning, okay? Ralph, don't go. Stay. I promised the fellas, Gracie. He stood up and straightened his clothes. They're waiting for me out home. She blazed to her feet, but the cry that was meant for a woman's appeal came out through her tightening lips as the whine of a wife. Can't they wait? What are you, crazy? He backed away, eyes round with righteousness. She would have to understand. If this was the way she acted before the wedding, how the hell was it going to be afterwards? Have a heart, will ya? Keep the fellas waiting tonight, after all they done for me? After a second or two, during which her face became less pretty than he had ever seen it before, she was able to smile. Of course not, darling. You're right. He came forward again and gently brushed the tip of her chin with his fist, smiling, a husband reassured. That's more like it, he said. So I'll see you at Penn Station, 9 o'clock tomorrow, right, Gracie? Only before I go, he winked and slapped his belly, I'm full of beer. Mind mind if I use your toilet or <laughs> your toilet? When he came out of the bathroom, she was waiting to say goodnight, standing with her arms folded across her chest, as if for warmth. Lovingly, he hefted the new suitcase and joined her at the door. Okay then, baby, he said and kissed her. Nine o'clock, don't forget now. She smiled tiredly and opened the door for him. Don't worry, Ralph, she said. I'll be there.